Welcome to this special Nishkam TV segment. Uh, I'm Sarpreet Singh. I'm a Boston-based uh, writer and playwright, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Tina Korpusricha today. Uh, Tina is visiting us here in Westboro. <clears throat> she is a documentary filmmaker based in India, and uh, today we had the opportunity to watch a powerful documentary that Tina Kaur directed uh, called When the Sun Didn't Rise. Uh, we will be talking about that film and various other things about uh, Tina Kaur's work today. Tina, welcome to Westboro and the Gurdwara Sahib and Nishkam TV, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Virji. I've been talking to you since a long time and it's absolute pleasure to be here and screen the documentary in this part of the world. Likewise, the pleasure is really mine. Now remind me, how long ago was it when you first got in touch with me about the documentary? That was two years back. Almost two years ago. <clears throat> so um, I remember you sent me a private link. I watched it. I was absolutely blown away. And then, of course, uh, you've had an extraordinary journey in the last two years uh, since we first connected. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the success of the film over the past couple of years? Yeah, so I concluded the film in 2017 and um, it was selected in a film festival in Washington, D.C. called as DC Asia Pacific Film Festival where it won the first award in Best Documentary Feature. So I did not come for that festival thinking that, you know, maybe I'll come at the time when I can screen it at various places, you know, I get an opportunity that would be better. Uh, but after that, uh, I think uh, with the grace of God, the film really picked up because it was um, selected in a number of film festivals in, in India, starting with the uh, Thiruvannathapuram in Kerala and then Mumbai International Film Festival then Kolkata and... Uh, and then it was picked up by some students in uh, UK who facilitated my trip to UK and it was screened in some 22 universities Wonderful. in UK. And starting with Oxford, like uh, Oxford was the eighth actually, uh, but it was absolute uh, pleasure to be interacting with students because they believe in hope and justice and they are the ones who are going to be the torchbearers of um, a particular this particular message of uh, truth and justice in the in the context of 84 ahead. Wonderful. I also remember uh, either reading somewhere or you mentioning that uh, you received a national award in India. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I never <coughs> thought that, you know, after all the screenings that I've done, and of course, you know, these are discussions which are very passionate and, you know, because we have this agony of not getting... A criminal justice in the case of 84 so I went I went back to India I was thinking I was like threatened thinking that you know I don't know what's going to happen to me because uh, you know we've spoken so much about uh, justice not being there which may be taken in any other way uh, but then soon you know I was contacted by one journalist in Indian Express and uh, he was the first one to write about 84 and he called me from Kerala and <coughs> saying that you know the film has been selected it was I was completely you know taken aback that uh, the category that it was selected was best investigative film and of course it was like a moment of honor not only for me but you know for the people whose stories were are there in the film and for anyone else who has, you know, been subjugated to any kind of violence in 84. So it's not that uh, the film got the award or I got the award. I think the award belongs to the Sikh community, to each and every one of us, as much as anyone else. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the jury was uh, very kind and, you know, they spoke to me about uh, this film and, you know, how it was... Uh, almost vetoed out of uh, the competition of films because it was it is in because a way a political film. Of course. So they didn't want the film to be there, but then the jury was very kind and they they stood by the film and you know they had to include it in the list. So I have a question about that, but before that, uh, you're being very modest about this, but for our, for the benefit of our uh, viewers, this was a big deal. This is a national award, right? So I think that you should really feel very, very good about it. And it's interesting what you mentioned. You spoke about it during the talk back after the film as well. 
that uh, you know um, there were some there were some thought that the movie was going to be taken out of contention uh, mm-hmm. because of its controversial uh, subject matter, and then the jury kind of put its foot down and said, uh, "No, this belongs here," and it won the award. Uh, does that tell us anything about um, you know the willingness? You see, there's a, there's a feeling among Sikhs in the diaspora in particular that nobody in India wants to talk about 1984. And there are reasons for that. You know, uh, you cite them very powerfully in the film, and you talked about them in the talkback as well. But uh, my question to you is, the fact that this went to so many festivals in India, got the kind of accolades that it did, and then won this national award, does that really tell us that if we take a step forward and try to tell these stories, people are willing to listen. Yes, absolutely. I 100% agree with you. See, I also believe that anything that we think and act, there is a record of that in the universe. Nothing gets wasted. You know? See, you know, of course, it took a long time for me to make this film because, you know, there were so many you know hurdles that I had to cross starting with the research and covering all angles and, you know, uh, raising funds for the film and all of that. But, you know, I think once it is made and people can see the value standing, uh, which are there in the film, I think they, they really love the film. And it's irrespective of community, irrespective of the language of the film. You know, when the first screening that happened was in Kerala, and there was a whole pack of some 500, 600 people who watched it in a film festival, and they did not know the language. They only watched it through the subtitles. And after watching the film, they, you know, there were women who came and hugged me and they were crying. And I could not resist myself because they say that, you know, we are completely, you know, blown away because, you know, they didn't know what happened in 84. <coughs> you know, because Kerala was, at that time, was very peaceful, you know, in 84. So uh, that's the power of a film and that's the power of conviction, you know, that's the power of our values and thoughts that go behind in documenting a film, which is, which stands for truth and justice. And of course, I think that's the reason that it touches the hearts of people, irrespective of community, it's, uh, you know, irrespective of the language and uh, any culture. So, uh, like, I had a very beautiful screening in University of Emory in Atlanta, Mm -hmm. where there was a mixed bunch of students who watched it. There were around 60 people who watched it. And they were from different parts of the world. They were studying justice there and law and justice. And we had a beautiful discussion later on, wherein they really liked the idea of taking it forward in the terms of film and in the context of 84. So, I think that... um, Anything that is done with conviction and with truthfulness, uh, definitely, you know, it touches the hearts of people, irrespective of, you know, any kind of language, culture or nationality or wherever we are. And like, see how violence does not have any language. So emotions also don't have any language. So it, it's about how we can tell our stories convincingly through the films. Uh, th- this is this is wonderful to hear, and uh, you know you're obviously very familiar with Kultar's mind, the play mm-hmm. about 1984, and that was the context in which you actually contacted me the very first time, and that was exactly the same experience. We had exactly the same experience. Uh, you know, we had gone to India with this preconceived notion as well that people are going to shut us up because nobody wants to hear about 1984. Uh, but the reality was completely different. It was exactly, you know, what you experienced at the film festival that you described. Yeah. Uh, people, you know, forget about the politicians, you know, common people, people who had no connection to six or, you know, the people of Delhi, really letting their compassion pour out. And it was a very powerful feeling. And I absolutely hear echoes of that in your comments as well. Uh, what that taught me was that our common humanity that links us and is really much more profound than our differences in India and everywhere else is alive and well. So, you know, in our talk back today, there was a young man who was very insistent in saying, we're not united, everything is horrible, what's the point of doing anything? So I would say that experiences like what, like the one that you've described 
really take us away from fatalism because you know if you had a fatalistic attitude you would never have made this film yeah you know you would have thought who's going to watch this yeah. even if they watch it what's going to happen yeah. so that's the power of something that unlocks our common humanity and i think that you are to be congratulated for making something that's uh thought provoking hard hitting and i would say at the end of the day very very honest mm. so that's the that's what struck me when i first watched your film and i think this is a good segue into talking a little bit about the film itself uh so uh i i'm not an expert on film by any no, means well, no, but uh you know when i watched your film uh the first time and it was sort of uh, driven home again when i watched it today uh i got a sense that this is unvarnished reality mm. and it's uh, you know you tell some pretty tough stories uh you tell them without being sentimental that's what i really loved about the film that it's you know very stark it shows what's actually happening and then it sort of really brings the humanity of the characters that you focus on right to the forefront so tell us a little bit about that tell us about your approach because you know you must have had to make lots of choices in terms of what you wanted to put in the film what you decided to edit out what informed your decisions about what ended up in the film in the context of my last comments i'd love to get your perspective So you know of course it's a very difficult choice to make when you go to a sorority of women staying together and bonding over pain because each one's story is more painful than the other yes. so how does one decide which one to put in the film which one not so of course you know at that time i realized that i have to stop being a filmmaker i have to stop thinking that i'm going to edit this and that you know because it was so overwhelming to hear those experiences that you know i was just reduced to a girl listening to the women uh you know and the experiences of life that they've lived and they are living today and the kind of challenges that they have and i think i ended up being a committed listener and i ended up being like a like you know making mental notes of uh, whatever they've experienced so i think at that time um uh, I felt as if I've lived hundred lives. Mm. Uh, even today, I don't feel that I'm on my own. I, when I remember everything that I've heard and experienced with whatever I've shared from these women, I feel that you know I feel that in one life I have lived so many lives. So that was the powerful experience that I was with, and then of course I let intuition guide me because I felt that that's the best judge. and um uh, you know it's like you tend to get connected with few people and you tend to get uh, drawn uh, to some people you know and it's just out of pure love and uh, i think that's that's just led me to believe in these people and who are a part of the documentary film indeed later. indeed so uh, so that was that and um, also you know i don't believe i think music uh, as a filmmaker i believe you, music is used to manipulate the emotions of people mm. it can be used in any way whatever we want to infuse whatever we want to you know accelerate in the film you know take it up so we can add the music in that way and just you know take it down like that so i because i felt that already whatever they are saying is so powerful it's so moving it's so emotional so i i wanted the music and uh, my voice to be pretty neutral you know and not like manipulate people to believe that oh what happened was bad mm. so i thought that you know my stand should be neutral my voice and the music should just you know just be you know in sync with what being is being said in the dialogues it should not take um, add the extra emotions to it because i felt that that's not the way to do it so i didn't want to manipulate it i just wanted it to be like a pure documentary <coughs> film so that was the reason that you know when you hear the 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 commentary the voice over in the film it's like stark and you know simple mm. and plain and um, i'm i'm very grateful to a lot of people who worked with me in the especially in the editing part of the film sorry i'm having a bad throat so uh <coughs> 
so there was Ollie Huddleston and uh, he uh, I'm fortunate that you know there was this um, uh, platform called Doc Walk in uh, Germany and they had this uh, thing in India wherein they connected a uh, few filmmakers with editors uh, who are there distributors who are there so Ollie Huddleston is uh, an England based uh, editor and he helped me in you know giving a perspective uh, in the film because he has nothing to do with 84 of course you know so he had a perspective which helped me realize that particular uh, film in, in a way which it makes it more international and which makes it more unique and acceptable by people of any community watching it because you know uh, he had this uh, thing of listening to me and asking me why I want to make the film and what is it that uh, the message should be towards the end and uh, we exchanged a lot of notes uh, uh, while uh, editing the film and so was this one gentleman called Michael Singh who was a filmmaker in US oh I know him yeah so so he was also you know part of the editing decisions uh, up to a certain extent and you know putting things together so that was... well I have to say that your choices work brilliantly because yeah. the film is hard hitting and uh, again uh, I keep coming back to the word the word honesty, and you know now that you've explained how you made your choices, it makes perfect sense. Uh, so you know, moving to a slightly different topic, uh, uh, your film is very disturbing at times, and uh, I'll say this from a very personal perspective, <coughs> from a sick perspective. Uh, you know, especially in the diaspora, yeah. uh, Sikhs tend to live in a bubble. In the sense that our community is largely affluent. Uh, you know, we, uh, a lot of us, uh, of course, have come from India. Our children are mostly born here. Uh, the <coughs> next generation certainly has no sense of life in India. But even we have started to forget. Now, you know, when I visited Tilak Vihar, the so-called uh, uh, wid widow colony that uh, your film, a lot of your film is shot in... I was struck by that same sense of disquiet that I felt while watching the film. It was actually more powerful in your film because your camera went to places that I certainly did not go. I mean, I met the people, I saw the grief firsthand, all of that I experienced. But you know, the image of a junkie who is a sick is very disquieting because nowhere in our universe do we encounter that. But that's the reality of Tilak Vihar. You know, I was told about this reality, but you actually showed this reality on film. And your character, I mean, you know, your interviews are haunting, really. That's the, that's the only word I can use to describe them. Uh, and very, very hard hitting. And I can only imagine how difficult it must have been for you to film it and, you know, put it together the way that you did. Uh, when I went to Tilak Vihar, I, you know, remember feeling very, very depressed. And you probably experienced that 10 times over. So my question to you is that when you worked with the survivors, uh, particularly those who had gone down the spiral of drugs and alcohol and whose lives were shattered, did you come away with anything at all that gave you a sense of hope? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I understand you saying that the film is hard hitting, you know, but the point is that I did not manipulate it. Of course, of you course. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. so the thing is that that's the truth. And that was the, exactly the reason that I wanted it to come out in, in, in a complete raw way, the yeah. way it is today. So, of course, it was very depressing for me when I was making the film. I mean, it was very difficult for me to be uh, not absorbing these emotions of people whom I'm interacting and meeting and staying with, you know. So, but then I think you know, coming back to Bombay and being in a different environment, you know, and realizing that I'm getting depressed because of whatever I'm experiencing in Delhi, uh, that helped me, you know, come out of it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and try and navigate it in a more positive way. But of course, it was not very easy. It really took me some time to understand why am I making this film and, you know, why, what is it that I'm trying to do? Uh, these are the questions that a person, you know, keeps asking when you hit challenges every now and then. So, 
this is the thing which is there but then i also felt uh, realize the fact that because these people have been marginalized in delhi mm-hmm. and because of the fact that you know they are <coughs> taking drugs or they are poor so no one really wants to deal with them okay? you know everyone wants and thinks and the way they talk to them is ki this is the way they are like you know forget about them like so i used to feel very bad that you know how can human beings you know and especially someone from your own community who has endured the same violence that anyone else in kanpur or any other place of the uh, india uh, endured that how can we just let them go just like that you know when we see that you know uh, the only thing that they need is like equality the only thing that they need is inclusion in the sikh society the only thing that they need is that you just go go there talk to them and have a cup of tea together and that's all some words you know of just sharing anything mundane also from life so that's what they are looking for but they are not getting it because of the fact that you know they are looked down upon because uh, some of them are taking drugs and you know they are not from uh, arora khatri families they are probably from some poor castes uh, within the sikh community i mean i don't understand i don't endorse any kind of caste in sikhism because i think everyone you know go from guru nanak dev ji to guru gobind singh ji taught us the same thing that you know they made panch pyaras they said you know everyone is equal but we are the ones who are looking at everyone from different perspectives and different lenses Indeed. which is very bad you know so so i think that is exactly the reason that you know that's why maybe the film uh, hits us because we've never seen that human conditions amongst the silk community can go down to that level or Indeed. and Indeed. also i think it's not even about uh, the living conditions because the living conditions are still fine but it is about the transgenerational trauma exactly uh, which people are facing and the emotional difficulties that they have today in looking back on the memories which makes me speak about the mental health issues which makes me uh think about the emotional issues that when one particular community or uh one but any any family is undergoing violence you know so you you uh, at least in these cases they got blankets they got jobs they got houses eventually they got a compensation but um, they also needed love they also needed uh, that kind of a um, uh, like an emotional uh, you know a way to be held and hugged and say that hey we are with you you know we we are together in this you know and some kind of a uh, emotional support which was needed which probably they did not get and i think again i would not blame anyone because there was this that's this gap of emotional like you know that comes it comes over a period of time and mostly people look at only the the financial or the socio financial uh, aspects of any massacre no one really thinks about <coughs> the trauma that it causes and you know how women are looking at their mm-hmm. memories today so so yeah i mean when i when there and i was listening to them i felt that you know i was one of them i mm-hmm. didn't feel any separation and probably that was also the reason that it took me time to make this film because it was emotionally difficult uh, situation for me to have that kind of separation you know that was there also because i think i was also trying to uh, get some kind of closure uh, get some kind of life purpose by making this film because i had also undergone lot at that time is my personal life so i was trying to you know find that kind of space or people to connect with and uh, now looking back when i see i realize that you know that was also one of the connections that i could make this film and and by the way just to clarify the fact that i uh, characterized the film as brutal and hard hitting was not meant to be a criticism in any sense it was actually applause uh, this is this is a tough story yeah. that really needed to be told and you've told it brilliantly you know there's really no other way to characterize it thank you very much for saying that i'll tell you one very interesting observation that happened in the last uh, place where i screened the film so some sikhs call me that i am a rss agent oh yeah really <laughs> <laughs> that i'm trying to you know portray uh, some kind of misery uh, which oh. is there and i was like oh really like is this the way to think also like i, I know let's just know. brush it under the rug yeah and pretend that you know chadhi kala hai charo paas hai bilkul so you know yeah. uh, you obviously have a tremendous amount of passion around this uh, 
as you know, uh, in our Nishkam TV program, we have a bunch of very enthusiastic, young, budding filmmakers. I think it would be very interesting for them if you were to briefly talk about your journey, your personal journey as a filmmaker, uh, when did you decide you wanted to make films? How did you get into filmmaking? Give us the short <laughs> version. I think it would be very interesting for them to hear. Okay, sure. So uh, I did engineering. I did production industry engineering. And um, my father always wanted me to be uh, some kind of businesswoman. You know? ah. He wanted me to study MBA and all that. But later on, uh, you know, like, like the way it happens in, uh, you know, Indian society and our families that, you know, there's a time when they say, they ring the bell and they say, nahi, nahi, chalo, shadi karo, shadi karo. So, <laughs> so that happened with me as well. And I was very taken aback because I was not really prepared for marriage, you know, at that point of time after engineering. And, and I really wanted to study further. But um, uh, uh, I could only manage whatever I could manage, you know, in terms of studying for mass communication. And I was also rebelling because, you know, I was not al allowed to study what I really wanted to. And then I said that, okay, I went inside me and I realized that as a child, I had watched one documentary on mining. And I remembered that, okay, that had such a powerful impact on me. And I said that, I want to do something like that, mm. you know, when I grow up and after my engineering, I said this. And then I had to find ways for that. So, of course, it was like five years of a lot of hard work because I was working in a call center. And then in the night I used to work and in the daytime I was studying. And it was a very difficult journey. And that was a time when, you know, like there were a lot of conflicts in the family because, you know, the fact that a girl who's an engineer is, you know, going on her own and, you know, working in a call center the night and, you know, doing this kind of mass communication studies in the daytime is like not the most, <laughs> not the most uh, common route that uh, Sikh women take. So, so, but then, you know, I assured my father, he said that don't tell anyone that you're working in a call center. Don't tell that, you know, I'm your father. I said, Papa, don't worry. It's okay. One day, you know, you'll be proud of me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, I'm sure he's very proud of you now. Yeah, he is. He's turned around a lot. <laughs> So, yeah, so, you know, uh, it was a lot of uh, work that goes into it. Uh, also, because I really felt bad that I could not go to a film school per se, like uh, pursue education in films. But then later on, I did not regret it because I realized that people who go to film schools, I mean, not all, but like it was just a general observation because I have a lot of friends who are from film school. Uh, the the burden of knowledge that is there mm. makes them inactive in going on the ground and making films. Interesting. So I and I was like, my goodness! I mean, just imagine had I been there. I mean, I don't know if I would have been also the same. You know, because you know, just not being able to take a decision is is such a thing. You know, because you have so much of burden of how filmmaking has progressed in last 200 years and what all has been done in the world in mind then that really you know uh, paralyzes you in making films or you know doing something on ground which may be a bit more humble i would say mm. uh, i said thank you god like you know it's okay i'm happy with the journey that i've had and the kind of life choices that i've made and of course i invested a lot of time in learning on my own mm. and then i got a fellowship uh, in screenplay writing from asia society Wonderful. that is supported by time warner foundation that was good and now i'm working towards feature films as well so taking steps i guess i should be inspired by you to say state on the record that i'm so happy now that i didn't get an mfa in writing Yes, 100%. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, what's next for Tina Kaur as a filmmaker? Tell us about that. Oh, yes, of course. Now, in this beautiful journey of life, what happened last year was that after the national, no, before the national award, seven days before the national award, I got detected of breast cancer. Mm. So, I, I mean, it, and there was like absolute darkness. Like, I did not know what am I going to do? What will be my life ahead? And, you know. Uh, how will I make sense of whatever life I have but then that's the way when I met my surgeon and I told him that you know he can go with the surgery and everything but I'm going to make a film about it 
So I'm making a documentary film on cancer. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yes, and it's a personal investigative film on cancer, wherein I'm documenting my own experiences with my family and how I survived cancer and also what causes cancer and what is the way to lead a healthy life ahead. So the film, uh, I'll be very, very grateful if you guys, I mean, all the people who are listening and watching uh, this particular TV show can go to Indiegogo or Facebook and uh, find the campaign. The film is uh, titled When the Light Entered My Wounds because uh, it was Ruby who said that uh, Wonderful. So, so the film is titled Noor When the Light Entered My Wounds. So we are doing a crowdfunding campaign to put Wonderful. together resources. Well, if it uh, ends up being even half as powerful as uh, the film that we watched today, I would say that it would be a project well worth supporting. Mm -hmm. So um, let me wish you the very best with your new venture. And I hope it's very, very successful. And I actually have a small gift for you. Oh. This is your copy of Kultar's Mind. Oh. I will sign it for you after we're done here. Oh, thank you very much for this. Well, so thank nice. you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as someone uh, who has personally been committed to really talking about 1984 and then working on the narrative around 1984 for a very, very long time, I just uh, want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making this powerful film. Uh, I think that every Sikh, particularly every young Sikh, needs to watch this film. It's an important part of our recent history that you don't find in history books. And you have really done a great service, not just to the Panth, but, you know, keying off of some of the very powerful comments that you made during the talkback. Uh, these are not issues that are unique to Sikhs. These are issues that affect humanity and being able to address them in such a powerful manner is truly a gift. So congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for listening to me. Thank oh, you very much. Pleasure.